with that said, this passage we're looking at, I, I chose to call counterfeit faith. You'll see it in, as we go through the study. But uh, again, what I'll do is I'll share a few things to remind us of where we've, uh, where we've been up to this point, and then I'll move into chapter 8. And uh, we'll be looking at a very interesting portion of Scripture today. So I'll begin reading here in chapter 8 uh, of the book of Acts at verse 1. I'll read to verse 4, give you your introduction, and then we'll move into our study. Again, I refer to it as counterfeit faith. Luke writes, now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house, dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Now, in chapter 7, we looked at the death of Stephen, who has been referred to as the Christ, first Christian martyr. We saw that Stephen was one of the first men who was appointed as what we today would refer to as, as a deacon. And this is one who had been used mightily by the Lord. In chapter 6 of Acts, verse 8, it says that Stephen was full of faith and power and that he did great wonders and signs among the people. So the people obviously had taken notice of him, and this drew opponents who began to argue and to dispute with him. But they couldn't resist. They couldn't withstand the wisdom of the Spirit by which he spoke. That had resulted in them making a false claim against him. They, they induced men to accuse him of blaspheming God, Moses, and the temple. He was taken before the council, and false witnesses delivered the charges. And we saw how Stephen gave a very eloquent presentation in defense of the faith. And point by point, he refuted the charges and presented Jesus Christ as Messiah. The result was that those who were his opponents were cut to the heart. They were enraged, and he was taken, and he was martyred. They cast him out of the city. They stoned him to death. Their cloaks would have impeded them from throwing stones, and because of this, they laid them aside at the feet of a young man whose name was Saul. And that was our introduction to the man who would become Paul. Now, as Stephen died, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He then said, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And we saw how he peacefully died. And so that's where we are now. And so we can begin in verse 1 where it simply says, Now Saul was consenting to his death. Saul was consenting to his death. He was in complete agreement to the fact that he believed that this man should die. He was consenting to his death. This is something that Paul never, never forgot. And this is something that Paul later refers to. I'll show you a few scriptures in a moment, but I'll point out to the fact that he spoke of how, how the Lord had spoken to him and, and had told him that he was to leave Jerusalem. And as he was giving his testimony, it's found in Acts 22, verse 20, um, when the Lord had said for him to leave, he responded by saying, when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. And so that's something that Saul, later Paul, never forgot, that he gave his consent to the death of this righteous young man. You see, Saul was in agreement with the council. Stephen should die. He was so opposed to Jesus that he believed all Christians should die. And that reminds us of something Jesus said in John 16, verse 2, where he had said, they'll put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to God. So when he came to faith in Jesus, his life was completely transformed. And even though he opposed Jesus, he was shown tremendous grace and tremendous mercy. We'll see that again in a moment. Well, as this is taking place, it says Saul was consenting to his death. But he goes on to say, at that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And so, until that time, as we've seen going through this book, the church lived a fairly peaceful and productive life. 
As far as unbelievers were concerned, believers were not considered yet to be any form of a threat. Christians were doing good for the community, and they were tolerated and even respected. In Acts 2.47, it says they were praising God and having favor with all the people. In Acts 5.13, it says that the people esteemed them highly. So from Pentecost to that time, the message of the gospel was going out in power. Opposition was beginning, but the church was numerically growing. Acts chapter 6, verse 7 says, the, the word of God continued to spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem grew rapidly, and a great number of priests became obedient to the faith. But now, persecution that is led by religious leaders begins to grow against them. They had been comfortable there in the city of Jerusalem. It became necessary for them to leave. Now, Jesus had commanded them to go into the world, and now they're going to do so. Because the church is being scattered. Notice it's being scattered throughout Judea and into Samaria. So as that's taking place, verse 2 says, Well, devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. Not every single believer left, but a great many did. The apostles remained behind, as did certain devout or righteous men. Now, as for Paul, or rather Saul, verse 3 he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. So some remained behind, and Saul came against them. And he did so in fury. When it speaks about him making havoc, he came against them with violence. He, he entered their homes. He had them imprisoned. Now, this is something that he never forgot. It's something that when you read your New Testament and he begins to speak concerning his former life, the life without Christ, he refers to. He spoke concerning his zeal in, cha in Philippians chapter 3, verse 6. And when he said concerning zeal, he said persecuting the church. One commentator said that there was an insane ferocity in his violence. And that's something he openly confessed in Galatians 1.13 he said to that church, you have, you have heard of my former way of life in Judaism, how severely I persecuted the church of God and tried, he says, to destroy it. Well, he later came to understand how wrong this was. He was even humbled by it. And so in 1 Timothy 1, he said in verses 12 and 13, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and persecutor, and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. I've heard the testimony of more than one person who was violently opposed to the gospel, violently opposed. And yet, when they got saved, they never forgot how violently opposed they were, and they actually became very strongly in favor of and preached the gospel with great, with great fervor. That's what happened to the apostle Paul. He said, I was shown mercy. I persecuted the church. Well, he says in verse 4, Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching. So Jesus had commanded them to go, and now they're pushed out and they're going. Wherever they went, they preached. They announced the good news. And so it speaks concerning the, the expansion of the church. In, in verse 5, it speaks of Philip. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord he did the things spoken by Philip hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed and, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. And so Philip goes down to, it says the city, it's actually a city of Samaria. And notice he preached Christ to them. Now this is not the apostle Philip. This is one of those who had been recently selected to be a deacon. He is one of the seven who were selected to oversee the ministry to the widows. So that gives us insight into this man that we're being reintroduced to. This is a man of good reputation. This is a man who was filled with the Spirit. He, have, he was filled with godly wisdom. He was submitted to authority. He was spiritually mature. This is the Philip that we're looking at now. Now Luke mentions him in such a way that you get a glimpse of his character because later in the book of Acts, in chapter 21, verses 8 and 9, he writes, On the next day, we who were, were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip the evangelist, 
who was one of the seven and stayed with him. Now, this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. You might find this interesting, but Philip is the only one in Scripture who's ever referred to as an evangelist. This is an office that speaks of a person's gifting to declare the gospel. In Ephesians 4.11, it says that he himself gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastors and teachers for the equipment of the saints for the work of ministry. He was one who held the office, but the only one in Scripture referred to as the evangelist. And this is a man who was obviously godly because it speaks of the fact that he had four virgin daughters who had come to faith in the Lord and prophesied in the name of the Lord. So he went to, notice verse 5, a city of Samaria to preach Christ to them. Now Samaria is a region that is about 40 miles north of the city of Jerusalem. And so Philip comes into that area. He's proclaiming that Messiah has come. You need to remember that that is a, a, an area that, that Jesus himself had ministered in. One of the most famous stories in Scripture concerns the woman at the well, the well of Sychar. We usually call it Sychar. How that Jesus needed to go through that region. And as he did so, there was a woman there that he had an appointment with, a woman at the well. It's a very famous story of how that Jesus went there, spoke to her, brought her to faith in him, and ultimately she declared this faith to other people. And so he'd been there. He had ministered in Samaria. But it's also in Samaria that Jesus' men became enraged at the Samaritans because they were not necessarily receptive to Jesus Christ. On one occasion, Jesus was going to Jerusalem, and he needed to pass through Samaria, so he sent messengers before him. The messengers are unnamed, but commentators say it more likely was James and John. And as they began to enter in, as the ones who were preparing for Jesus to enter into the cities and all, the villagers became hostile because they were Jews who were coming through, and they were on their way to Jerusalem. In Luke chapter 9, verses 54 through 56, it says, When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, just as Elijah did? Have you ever wanted to do that? I do that almost every day. <laughs> but he turned and he rebuked them. And he said, You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man didn't come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. And so these were people, these Samaritans, that Jesus had ministered to, but were not necessarily receptive to him. Now, Jesus had said, you're to take this gospel, and you're supposed to preach it throughout the world. And so the gospel is now moving out of Jerusalem into the area of Samaria. And the area of Samaria is an area filled with people who reject Jews and are rejected by Jews. In John 4, verse 9, it simply says, Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And yet, Philip has taken the gospel into this unnamed city of Samaria, and as a godly man, he's taken the gospel to the least loved people in the area. He's taking the gospel to the people that are rejected by other people. As I was preparing my notes, I couldn't help but remember how that my own pastor did the same, a similar thing when Pastor Chuck began to take the gospel to the hippies. And he paid a price for it. But you take the gospel to those who are in need, right? And that's what Philip is doing. God hasn't rejected the Samaritans. God has a plan for their salvation also. And notice how it says in verse 5, he began preaching or proclaiming Jesus to them. Now the Samaritans were like the Jews. They had an anticipation that Messiah was to come. It says in John 4, 25, the woman at the well said to Jesus, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. So they had an anticipation for Messiah. And so Philip is taking this message to tell him Messiah has come. Well, as he's doing so, it says in verse 6, the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing 
the miracles which he did for unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. There was great joy in that city. Now, it may be that they already had an awareness of Jesus in a sense because of what that Samaritan woman had done. She had brought men to see Jesus, and, and many of the men that she had brought to see Jesus had believed in him. Many others came to faith in him as they were listening to him speak. In John 4, 42, it says, They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we've heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. And so the gospel is now going out in more full force, more openness, through Philip, and he's preaching, and as he does so, notice verse 7, unclean spirits were crying out with a loud voice, and they were coming out, and there were many who were healed. And so as Philip is preaching, healings and miracles, and, and even the casting out of demons is taking place, and the Lord is confirming his word by the signs that accompany it. Verse 8 says there was great joy in that city. Salvation and deliverance is abounding. You see, when the Lord is moving amongst people, joy will be the fruit. It says in Isaiah 12, verse 3, with joy you will draw water out of the wells of salvation. I don't know what you were like when, when you got, got right with God. I don't know what you were like when Jesus saved you. But I can tell you in my own personal experience that there was an overwhelming sense of joy, that the Lord had saved me, that my sins had been forgiven, that I'd been washed clean from all of that unrighteousness. And, and what at one time was a, a heart of depression and sorrow and grief constantly and rejection and loneliness was transformed. And now I, I knew the God of the universe and, and I had a relationship with the Lord and, and there was a joy in my heart. It's a deep, settled joy. It wasn't a, a joy that made me giggle all the time. I was still sober-minded. But it was a joy that was so deep and so real and has never left. The joy of the Lord is my strength and the salvation of the Lord is an incredible experience, and that's what happens when people get saved. When you realize that your sins have been forgiven, that you've been washed clean, that you're brand new, you have a joy, and that's what's taking place, and they're seeing these works and these miracles, and they're listening to the gospel, and something incredible is taking place. Well, as this happens, verse 9, but there was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city, and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed, from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. So let's look at this man here. We're going to look a little bit at counterfeit, at the counterfeit faith. Simon is a Jewish name, but it was a name that was also used by Samaritans. So it's unknown whether or not he is Samaritan, Jewish. It's not really clear. But one thing we do know, Simon is a deceiver. And Simon had the people completely in awe of him. The scripture tells us that this is one who practiced sorcery. The word sorcery, M-A-G-O-S, magos, the word sorcery is where you get the word magic. It was used to speak of astrologers and soothsayers, necromancers. A necromancer is someone who purports to speak to the dead, and fortune tellers. Some of these quote-unquote sorcerers used magic spells in an attempt to perform miracles. And so he was a deceiver. He was someone who practiced sorcery. He practiced the magical arts is what it's saying. And verse 10 tells us that uh, all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. So that gives you a little more insight that you might not see at first. When it says this man is the great power of God, that's actually a claim to deity. Some thought that he was the Messiah. In Mark 14, 62, Jesus said, You will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with clouds of heaven. So the power was another way of speaking of Messiah. 
And so he was thought of by some to be the great power, the great power of God, which is another way of speaking of him as the Messiah. And so that's the kind of reputation he has. It says in verse 11, they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. They listened carefully to him because he had done so many things that, that appeared to be supernatural that they came to believe that he truly was some great one. They liked the, the magic that he seemed to perform. There's a debate as to whether or not he actually was able to pro perform works or not. But if there were miracles or apparent miracles, those miracles would have been satanic in origin. How do we know that? We know that because Satan can perform counterfeit miracles. In Matthew 24, verse 24, Jesus said, False Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9, the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie. So there are such things as satanic miracles or counterfeit miracles. And so if he is actually performing miracles, these are counterfeits that are drawing people to call him the Messiah. But as this is taking place in all, verse 12 says, when they believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. And so what's taking place is they're believing the message. They're believing Philip as he's preaching those things. They're beginning to trust in Christ. And as these people are beginning to follow after Philip in them, not necessarily Philip himself, but the message and the one he's, he's proclaiming, what happens is... Simon's following begins to dwindle. He had a great group of people who would follow after him, but now that crowd is beginning to grow smaller. And so people are trusting in the Lord as that crowd is beginning to shrink. Now Simon amazed them, but his works were no match for the Spirit of God. You see, he may have been able to provide some apparent miracles, but the gospel provided forgiveness and the miracles were real. Just because he was performing some amazing thing, or at least they thought he was, didn't mean their sins were being forgiven. You can believe in something that's miraculous or at least appearing that way, something supernatural, but that doesn't mean your sins are being forgiven. You need to have the gospel proclaimed. You need to hear that Jesus died on a cross for you. You need to know that he was buried because he died, you need to know he was resurrected. So the, the signs and wonders that are performed were giving opportunity for the proclamation. Simon didn't have anything to say. Simon had become the focus of attention. But when, when Philip was preaching, he had performed these miracles. It drew their attention. They listened to his word. They were forgiven of their sins. They followed Christ. And the sorcerer is watching this take place and as he's watching his people dwindle and this crowd growing, he becomes interested in what's being said. Notice what it says in verse 13. Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Simon was impressed by the signs. He even saw evidence of the power of God. And he was convinced that, that Philip had a source of power that was great, and he wanted that source of power. He wasn't a sincere convert to Christ. He saw the works and was amazed. He believed the miracles, but he didn't receive the message. Again, belief in miracles alone never can save you. Such belief only opens you up to deception. So Simon recognized great power. He witnessed the signs that were performed and that resulted in a counterfeit conversion. He was hungry for power, but not the power of salvation. He was hungry 
to be able to perform these works and to do these things. But he didn't, he didn't repent. He didn't ask for his sins to be forgiven and cleansed. This is actually Satan's attempt to sow a tear in God's wheat field. We've already seen how that earlier Ananias and Sapphira had presented themselves as believers when, in fact, they weren't. Well, here we have it again. We have someone named Simon who has even, has even gone so far as to receive water baptism. So water baptism, once again, we shared this last week when we had our water baptism. Water baptism doesn't save you. We know that. It's not the washing of the, the flesh with water, but it's the sprinkling of the blood of Christ on our conscience that purifies us and gives us new life. People get water baptized, but that doesn't mean that they're being saved. Just a couple days ago, I um, went, Marie, I, John, and, and, and Liv went to, uh, had to go to L.A. because when, uh, when we went to uh, New Mexico a couple weeks ago, uh, I left my iPads uh, at the airport, and so they had it in the lost and found, and so we went and uh, went and picked up my, uh, two of my iPads and all. And, and as we were there uh, uh, at the airport, you know, the Spirit spoke to my heart and said, let's go to Philippe's. And some of you know where <laughs> Philippe's is. <laughs> Philippe's has the best sandwiches in L.A., I think. That's my opinion. And if you differ, you're wrong. You can leave the church. <laughs> no, Philippe's is great. And uh, so we went there. And as we were driving home, you have to go by Alvera Street. And as you go by Alvera Street, a lot of you know exactly what I'm talking about, where I'm speaking about, every one of us know Alvera Street. Well, there's a little church there, the Plaza Church. I was baptized there. I went by there. They have a plaque, David Rosales. No, they don't. <laughs> I was telling them, though, I said, you know, I was uh, four months old, and my mom, at the age of 20, took me there and found the priest, and I was baptized in the Plaza Church. And so I think every Mexican kid in California was baptized at the Plaza Church. And so I told John and, and Marie and all and Liv, and I said, I was baptized there. I have the certificate at home that, that reminds me of that. That baptism didn't save me. All that did is it gave me a, washed my hair. I was four months old. Why? Because it isn't water baptism that saves you. It's a clean conscience because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And see, what happened with Simon is he heard and he saw certain things that he agreed with. He saw the baptism and he submitted to it, but he wasn't converted. He didn't come to faith in Christ. There was something else that was motivating him. He didn't have a saving faith. If he had any kind at all, it's what people would call an intellectual. You have uh, an intellectual faith and you have a saving faith. We used to say you have a head faith and you have a heart faith. You can have a head faith because, again, using my own life as an example, I, I, I went through the different, different kinds of, um, of um, sacraments, including my first communion and, and uh, sacrament of penance and all of that. And uh, I was able to recite certain creeds and certain formulas and and certain prayers, you had to do that in order to be able to be uh, getting, get your first communion and all, and your confirmation, which I did. I, I had that kind of intellectual knowledge. I, I was able at the age of 12 and 13 to, to share some of the rudiments of the gospel. I knew, in other words, that there was a God. I knew that there was a trinity. I knew that there was, there was a, a Messiah. I knew the Messiah's name was Jesus. I knew that Jesus was born on a day we celebrated, calling it Christmas. I, I, I knew that there was one called the Holy Spirit. I knew through confir confirmation that there was, a, uh, in, in that, there was a, a confirming of my quote-unquote faith in Christ. I knew those things. But I wasn't a saved person. It's easy to know things, but not know Him. And, and Simon heard things, agreed with things, even went through a ritual but Simon was not saved. There was something else motivating Simon. 
And this is what's taking place here. Notice how it says in first, verse 13 that he continued. He, con he continued with Philip. Now, why would he do that? Why would he submit to baptism and, and continue uh, following after Philip? Why would he continue with Philip being amazed at the miracles and signs that he saw? Well, one, it would be to keep in contact with the people that he had influenced in the past and impressed. And a second thing would be to learn how to perform signs and, and miracles like, like, like he was going to have a magician's trick taught to him. And then third, to try and figure out where this magical power came from. And so he's continuing and he's observing it's what he's doing. Well, in verse 14, when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of Jesus. And then they laid hands on them and they received this, the Holy Spirit. So Peter and John, according to verse 14, these apostles there at Jerusalem, they come down. You see, word had come to Jerusalem that Samaritans were receiving the gospel. And notice how it, it, the, uh, the word of God, the phrase the word of God is being emphasized. And so Peter and John uh, came to see what was happening amongst them. And then in verse 15, when they came down, they prayed that they might receive the Spirit. Now, what they're doing here is they're praying that they'll experience what, what I would refer to as their own Pentecost, if you will. You see, the prayer, someone said, pointed to the gift of the power of the Spirit as had been given on Pentecost. It assumed that such gifts were distinct from the new birth. Verse 16 says, speaking of the Spirit, for as yet he had fallen upon none of them. He had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Let me develop this with you for a moment. Jesus earlier in his earthly ministry had said that the Spirit, he said in John 16, 17, will be with you and will be in you. So they've experienced the with and the in. But in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he had said the Spirit will come upon you. Now this term that the Spirit will come upon you is used other times in, in Acts. In Acts 10, 44, while Peter was speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. Again, Jesus had said the Spirit would come upon them. So in faith, they had received the word. And in faith, they had received water baptism. They had placed faith, in other words, in Jesus Christ, and they'd been brought into his church. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13, Paul later says, by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. So as a result, they revealed sincere faith by water baptism. They openly were confessing that they were dead, buried, and resurrected in Jesus Christ. We see that again in the book of Romans chapter 6. These were people who were sincere in their faith. They were real believers. But they still need the power of God. Now remember, on Pentecost, 120 were baptized by the Holy Spirit, and gifts were exercised. We saw how they spoke in tongues, and later we saw how Peter preached with the Spirit's boldness. So the Samaritans are saved but they are not yet baptized with the Holy Spirit. So the apostles came to lay hands on them to validate the reality of their faith. And this is part of what Jesus had said in Acts 1 when he said at verse 8, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, and Judea, or rather, and Samaria. And so this is the expansion of that work. Jerusalem, Judea is the southern portion of Israel, going north into Samaria. And so they lay hands on them in verse 17, and they receive the Holy Spirit. Now, the laying on of hands, we saw that earlier in chapter 6, when they laid hands on the deacons, commissioning them. 
This represents the, them being a, a channel that God was using. Paul later will speak of this kind of thing in 2 Timothy 1, verse 6, where he said, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. And so they've come to lay hands on them that they would be baptized in the Holy Spirit. In verse 18, when Simon saw that through the laying on of the, of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Spirit. So he sees something take place. What is it? Because he sees something. No commentator is able to say exactly what it is, but he did see something because it makes it very clear. Simon saw that the lane, through the lane on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given. What did he see? I lean in the direction that they spoke in tongues and prophesied. He saw something. There was some external evidence that occurred and he wants it. Now, in his way of thinking, these men had great power, and he greatly desired that power. Now, he would have made deals with other magicians to learn their secrets, and for him, this seemed to be a great magical power to wield. He says in verse 19, Give me this power also that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. It made sense to him to get this secret power, to buy it if necessary. Here's something for you, and I want it to be practical. It's something to remember. Nothing God has is for sale. God's gifts cannot be bought. People still try to receive this power through acts of the flesh. Sometimes, and I've seen it, I've been there, they may be crying they may be begging, they make promises, and they're trying to somehow obtain this power through their own efforts and desire. But the Holy Spirit is poured out freely upon those who in genuine faith ask. In Luke eleven thirteen, 13, it says, If you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? But he says in verse 19, give me this power also that anyone on whom I lay hands on may receive it. He didn't ask them. Now notice this. He did not ask them to lay hands on others that they might be blessed. He didn't say, I want, to, I want this so I can bless others. He tried to buy a position so that he could do this for himself. That is called simony. That's a word that the church still uses. It's trying to purchase a grace gift of God for your own use, trying to buy a position. He wanted to be equal to the apostles and greater than Philip. Now remember that, because Philip came, Philip preached, Philip performed works, people believed the gospel, Philip was preaching, but the baptism of the Spirit didn't come until Peter and John came. He didn't go to Philip and ask, he went to Peter and John, why? Because he wanted to be greater than Philip. Why? Because Philip had taken his converts, had taken his people. And so he's looking at this as a way to get some more authority or to even have greater authority. If I can buy this magic trick from these two fellas, I can retain or I can uh, get once again my position. That's what's going on in this evil man's heart. He wants to be equal to the apostles and greater than Philip. Well, when this takes place, verse 20, Peter said to him, your money perish with you because you, you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You, you have neither part nor portion in this matter for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Now, this is a little shocking in a way, but I'll, I'll tell you what it says, what it's actually saying here. When he speaks, and every commentator points to the same thing, and I'll read it to you again, your money perish with you. When Peter says that, there is a little literal translation. Little, literally, Peter is saying, to hell with you and your money. 
That sounds like my mom. I mean, that, that is... <laughs> That is a very, well, you can imagine. That is, he's not, he's not, people say, well, he was a fisherman, all fishermen swear. No, that's not true. He was actually pronouncing on him a judgment. Your money perish with you. Your money go to hell with you for wanting it. That is such a strong thing to say that it actually shakes up Simon, he's saying, you, you tried to buy what God freely gives, and this is blasphemous, he's telling him. It is utterly wrong. You tried to turn our hearts from God, and you tempted us to sell his grace gifts. In Matthew 10, verse 8, Jesus said it like this. He said, heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out demons. He went on to say, freely you have received, freely give. Remember this. Next time you're watching a TV preacher who tells you, if you send me some money, I'll send you some seeds that you can plant, and your faith will grow even as those seeds. Or the next time they say, send me some money, and I'll send you an anointed prayer cloth, and you put it on any portion of your body that may hurt, and, and because the man of God has prayed over it, you will receive a healing, but you need to send your gift. And the more you want your healing, the greater your gift. If you want a $10 healing, send a $10. But if you want a complete healing, have you heard that? I have many times. It breaks my heart, disgusts me, but it's true. It's the same spirit. It's the same wrong attitude. Freely you have received. Freely you give. The Lord is the one who does the work. You can't buy his office. We know that, but a lot of people don't seem to understand that. Don't be sending your money to these charlatans. Don't be sending your money to these liars. Oh, I, oh how much time do we have? I mean, I can... <laughs> this is one of my areas of... I get angry over a real anger because my mother was ill. My mother died of an illness. My mother held on asking by, by faith, God, heal me till the day she died. She wasn't healed. And it isn't because God isn't a loving God or a gracious God. And it isn't because she didn't send her money to this preacher. It's simply because that happens. Disease happens and takes lives. We pray for healing, yes, but it's God who heals. And no man should sell God's grace. It's wrong. It's wrong. I've heard them say, I've heard them say, if you don't send money, our ministry goes down. And I say, go down. Go down. Because we don't need that. The kingdom of God, I, I'm telling you, this is one of the things I get really worked up. I was afraid about it, but I do. I hate that because it's lying in the name of Jesus Christ. And it's taken advantage of brokenhearted, hurt people. We should love them, show them compassion and care for them and not take from them. It bothers me that much. It bothers me that much. I'm sorry. It breaks my heart. It breaks my heart. So many have been turned from the gospel because of these liars. And that's what's taking place. Your money perish with you. You sought to buy a gift of God. Don't be sending your money to these charlatans. Don't be sending your money to these people who say that unless you send them money, you will not be healed. Our God is able to heal any place, any time, because he is our God. And he doesn't require my money. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Why does he need my dollar? He doesn't need it. Anyway, I'll go back. <sighs> that's, that's one of... I have some areas that I get very passionate about. That's one of them. He's saying, you are poisoned by bitterness and you are bound by iniquity. You are a slave to sinful desire. You want to be some great person. But in fact... You are in bondage. In Proverbs 5.22, his own iniquities entrap the wicked man. He is caught in the cords of his sin. Well, when he says that to him, verse 24, Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me that none of the things which you have spoken may come upon me. So when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, 
they returned to Jerusalem preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Now, doesn't that sound sincere? But he didn't repent. He didn't want evil to come upon him. He didn't ask to be forgiven. He asked Peter to pray, but he never prayed a prayer of repentance for himself. This man was not a genuine convert. This was not a true follower of Christ. He wanted to buy the gift of God because he wanted to use it to make himself into a great one. Every genuine Christian and every genuine pastor, I would even emphasize the pastor, the leader, should be asking God for humility to make them a broken and humble person so that in spite of themselves, God may be seen. There are some who want to be seen themselves. There are others who are saying, God, make me invisible so that you are seen. Simon wasn't the one who said, make me invisible. Simon was the one who wanted to be seen. He wanted to be some great one. And even when he was told to repent, he never repented. He just said, pray for me that this doesn't happen to me. He didn't say, I was wrong. God, forgive me. And so, as we close, we remember that God's power is available to us today. So may we seek God for his Spirit's power that we might be used for his glory.